Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Robin Shravitz. I'm the town's facility manager. Um, so I'm working with the Senior Center Study Committee to develop the feasibility report for the Senior Center building and figure out what its needs are. Um, we went through a long, rigorous process, um, and this is the first, well actually I think we had a couple before COVID, so we're getting back into the swing of things now with some public information meetings on the presentation and the content of the report that we had done for the building. Um, feel free to ask questions. We, if it's important to where the slide is, raise your hand and the presenter can call on you in the middle so we don't have to hold them to the end. I'm happy to have a dialogue going through this. And um, most of the presentation today will be the architects that we hired, which was Bargman Hendry and Architect, and their civil engineer was Parr Corporation. So Rachel Young and Lance Hill are here from the design team as well for today. Also in, his, um, in attendance today, Jeff Bridges, the town administrator, is here, and Leslie Wong, the senior center director, is, is in the back. So the quick history on the project is back in 2015, some of the Council on Aging members decided to form the study committee for the senior center building six years ago. Um, they completed a survey community back in 2015 to find out what the needs of the town were at that time, which led them into a needs study, and that showed that there was a lack of square footage here in this building and facility to offer all the programs and services that the Council on Aging can offer to the town to help its residents. So, in 2020, the town appropriated funds for a feasibility study, and that's what we're here to present today, the results of that feasibility study. Um, it reviewed 480 Main Street, which is the current property here. I also reviewed new construction options at 70 Cedar Street and 80 Haynes Road, Route 15. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel Young from BHH. She's gonna talk a little bit about the study. So this is my first in-person meeting since COVID and it feels really great. So it's great to see everyone here today too. Um, so I've been working on this project for over a year. When did we have the interviews? But yeah, two years. Two, two years. Um, so it's been a while. Um, and I'm here today representing Bargman Henry, the architect that was chosen to work on the feasibility study. Let me know if I need to speak louder. It can be soft spoken at times. And again, first meeting, I'm not really used to like standing and speaking. Um, yeah, sure. No problem, I can try to project. Um, so we were chosen to uh, facilitate a feasibility study for the town of Sturbridge. A feasibility study is basically where we look at the needs of the existing center, as well as what the future needs might be, and say, how do these needs work on various sites the town has selected? So the town gave us three sites, including the existing one here, to evaluate and say, does this work with the proposed program, future expansion, growing needs, population growth in the senior population. How does all of that work on each site? We look at the building and so the programming that goes inside the building. We look at the programming that goes on outside the building, including recreation spaces like terraces, green spaces, outdoor spaces. And we also look at, in, at um, aspects of the project like parking. And Lance today will talk a little more about that. So those are all the different things that go into a feasibility study. Once we evaluate each site, we look at the costs for each site. One site might be more expensive than another. We present that information to the town, which is what we're doing today, and then the town gets to look at the information. We're an impartial presenter, if you will. We collect the information, analyze it, and provide it in an impartial way, and it's up to the town to say, this is our preference because of one factor or another. So, a little about our approach to designing senior centers. Um, this is what I do, it's my bread and butter. I love doing senior centers and community centers. Um, and there are just a few values or philosophies that we use in our design approach. Um, we like to create spaces that foster all of these different types of interactions. Volunteering, lifelong learning, wellness, so a visiting nurse, a professional office, activities that promote physical health, 
um, an information center, especially this last year, I think we've realized how important senior centers can be to communicate uh, to communities in terms of communicating information. Um, and then, of course, socialization, that all these spaces, all these different programs and opportunity for people to come together, interact, build friendships and, um, and relationships. Uh, so working with the town of Sturbridge, we developed this building program. A building program is basically saying, what are all the different spaces? What are all the different rooms you want in your center? How big do they need to be to accommodate your programs? For example, the room we're in now needs to accommodate this many people for a public meeting. So if you told us that you needed a public meeting room that accommodated 50 people, we would come back and say, okay, that's about 800 square feet, 700 square feet. We would give you a number and a size associated with that particular use. So the building program that we developed is based on an approximately 12,000 square foot center. So that's a, a medium sized senior center in this general, general area. Um, it's not too small, not too big. The program elements that went into the building program were a generous lobby, a gracious space where you can come in and be received, meet and, uh, meet and uh, be greeted, a gift shop, a multi-purpose room. A multi-purpose room is similar to the space we're in here. It's a large room that can accommodate different types of presentations and activities. Uh, a commercial kitchen. This is a large kitchen that can be used to support the multi-purpose room, to, to um, cook meals for meal programs, to cook meals for meals on wheels programs, um, to have cooking classes. That's what a commercial kitchen is used for. And to distinguish it from a regular kitchen, it has commercial appliances, um, it can be used by professional staff. Generally, they're licensed by the Board of Health. They can be used in maybe like a shelter emergency. So that's what makes a commercial kitchen just a little more than a regular kitchen. And generally, they're larger because of that. Um, a workout room, an exercise tai chi room, a game room. This is a smaller room with a billiard table in it. Um, a small meeting room for smaller group activities or private meetings. Uh, flexible room or professional room. This might be where you have a visiting professional, like a tax professional, a visiting nurse, those types of, of programs. Um, space for the, the staff that works here, a director's office, outreach coordinator office, uh, a desk uh, space for the chef that would be working in that kitchen to run their daily programming, a veterans affairs office, um, health and wellness office, and then basically everything that's done towards the bottom are the support spaces. Those are the spaces that aren't used for any kind of programming, but you need in order to have a functional building. So like your restrooms, your mechanical spaces, your stairs, your circulation. All of that, after developing all that program, again, we came to a total size for this center of about 12,000 square feet. Some of the things that we looked at in developing this program and laying out some conceptual floor plans were how much storage you needed, how flexible can a space be. This room is a perfect example. We went from having a workout class to having a presentation in a matter of minutes, but that required people to come in and move the chairs and get everything set up. If you don't have the staff to do this, then you need to have two rooms so that you can accommodate both programs at the same time. Those are the types of conversations that we've been having over the last year about how to right size your building. Um, and this is just an example of a room. You can see that it's got all this stuff pushed up against the side because there is a lot of use for it and it's constantly being set up and broken down throughout the day. Again, very labor intensive to do that. Um, this is a multi-purpose room that we had designed for the center in Needham. It is divisible, so it has an optical partition that goes down the center. You can kind of see a seam here and it's collapsed and it's pocketed against the wall. Those partitions give a space more flexibility because you can use a whole space for a really big program or obviously divided if you have two smaller ones. It helps um, use the building more efficiently. And our the multi-purpose room that we designed has one side that's associated with a kitchen so that you can have meals programs and maybe have a partition up so you can have a completely different program like a exercise class maybe on the other side. Um, multi-purpose rooms come with storage, large amounts of storage. We can never give you enough storage. There's always a need. Um, and what happens if we undersize the storage is you have run into situations like this where you have tables and chairs that are stored in the kitchen. This is the last thing we want. And so storage, often neglected, is one of those things that we really try our best. We really endeavor to make sure it's in your program. Um, I talked about the commercial kitchen before. And so we've designed kitchens that look 
different ways and have different um, components to them. There are commercial kitchens like the one on the left, which is really a traditional commercial kitchen. Everything is stainless steel, all the appliances are commercial grade, and they can be used by professionals. The downside is a layperson, a volunteer, might not be very comfortable working in a kitchen like this. They might have to go through a lot of training to really understand how to use the different pieces of equipment. A hybrid approach is to do a kitchen like I have here, which is recently completed from Falmouth, um, which has some commercial uh, components to it, but it also has some components like the island in the center that are a little more residential in feeling, that are a little more warm, that allow to have cooking classes, that are more welcoming for a layperson, and you can always do a compromise between them. We've done so many different kitchens that have this aesthetic and that have different elements of a residential kitchen, um, and it's really user preference. And I will say that, again, the major implication at this phase in when we're looking at sizes of spaces is that a commercial kitchen just tends to be larger. Um, fitness space. A fitness space is another important space for you. Um, you have a lot of fitness activities, and I think what we went through when we were designing this space with you was just to highlight that there are different needs with different user groups, different age groups. Senior centers are not just for, you know, 75 plus. The age, you know, just like baby boomers are not just 60 year olds. So we wanted to make sure that the space that we designed for you could accommodate different types of workout activities. And for example, it, chairs are a really popular uh, piece of equipment for like chair size exercise classes. They require space for storage. So if that's a popular program or you think you're gonna expand that in the future, we wanna make sure that we're providing storage for that particular program. So these are all of the thoughts that go into our development of the program. Um, and then the last point is just about flexible versus purpose-built spaces. So a flexible space is one that you can accommodate all sorts of different activities. It might have operable partitions, or in this case, this has collapsible ping pong tables so that it can be converted quickly, easily into a different use. A purpose-built type space, like this billiard room, it's meant for a billiard room. It's meant to house a billiard table and some soft seating, large pieces of heavy furniture which are not gonna get moved around. That's pretty much all it's gonna be used for. Can't use it for a knitting class, can't use it for a book club, it's your billiard room. And both are fine. It's just a matter of compromise and figuring out which is more important and how you allocate your space. Um, and then we always try to create those informal spaces for socialization, for interaction. The spaces where you know you might be waiting for a class and you run into someone who's just getting out of the class before you. Those opportunities to really get to know your neighbors, the staff. Um, so we create these lounges. This is the lounge again from Falmouth that has a very elegant, you know, formal feel with a glass fireplace and bookshelves soft seating, a really cozy place where you can, you can just lounge about. Or it might be just a small table and chairs off of the lobby, again, a place where you are seen and, and can see others. Or it could be um, a small meeting room like this. This is in uh, Cohasset, where, um, again, it's a small informal group type of meeting space for like your knitting club, your reading groups, your mahjong. Um, so part of the feasibility study in addition to looking at the program and understanding the size and types of spaces you need, the other aspect was looking at the different sites, and that included this existing building here. So I'm gonna talk a little about our evaluation of the existing building. I wanna start off by saying this is a lovely building. I can tell that it's, it's much loved by the users and the staff, it's well maintained, and it just has a wonderful character and history. I always love working on renovation projects. I just, I'm a history buff, I love old buildings. And this is a beautiful building. Um, but unfortunately, the building combined with the site mean that there are some limitations in redeveloping it. Um, it has the front entrance with the three main stairs, none of which are accessible. It would be hard to, hard but not impossible to add a ramp in the front just because it starts to alter the historic character of the main facade of the building and it's a little redundant to have three entrances. What do you do with them? 
Um, in addition, the stairs themselves, they would need new railings, not insurmountable, but again, just a limitation. Um, you have the site itself. Right now, we have some generous green space in the front, which I was happy to see was used for tents, which I'm sure came in really handy this past year. Um, parking for this building in order to both expand the program and then provide the parking would really max out the site in this particular site. Unfortunately, it's just a little too small. Um, I'll go back to that one. The accessibility, just to touch on, we have a ramp and an elevator that were installed in 98. There are some upgrades that would have to happen to that to meet current code today. And then I think the, the largest issue we have for this building is the basement space. That basement is just a little too low in terms of ceiling height to really meet code. And it just, it's not a great space because it's a little low in ceiling height either. I mean, sometimes the things that code requires are also just smart ideas for, for design. And it's, it's a low ceiling height. I'm not sure, I might have a photo in here of my boss, Joel, who's probably like 6'3", trying to get down the stairs, and I think he knocked his head. Um, your kitchen, we talked about the size requirements for a commercial kitchen. The kitchen is a little undersized. What we're proposing, if we chose to work with this site, does expand that kitchen, but that's just, again, one limitation of the existing site as is. Um, we have our lovely um, gift shop area. It really deserves its own space. We, can, we know that the, the main spaces in this building are, are taxed, if you will, really used for a lot of different programming. Um, which is challenging for the staff at times. Um, the main stair, beautiful stair. I love the front stair. Definitely a challenge in terms of accessibility. It's a little too narrow to pass current code. And then how do you design around it um, in order to make this building site work? So those are all evaluations, if you will, that went into this particular site. Now I'm going to ask Lance to come up and talk about the other two sites, which would be new construction. Just to clarify, when we were looking at this site, it was in the context of how can we renovate the existing building and build an addition onto it that would accommodate a new senior center. Not demolishing this building or anything dramatic like that. Taking this building, renovating it, putting a new addition on the back, providing new parking. Then Lance and, and uh, my firm together looked at the two other sites, which, which would be new construction, totally new senior center. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Lance Hill. I'm a civil engineer. I work for Park Corporation. And much like Rachel does everything from the building walls in, we typically support uh, from the building walls out to the property lines. So we took a look at the existing site here and uh, what would be entailed to provide parking for the program that was uh, being developed by uh, Rachel's group. And then we took a look at two other sites around town, uh, one being at 70 Cedar and one being at 80 Haynes. Should I click right? This was the center one. Oh, the center one. Yeah. All right. So uh, the first step that we take uh, is, you know, it is building a, uh, a building on this particular piece of property that we're looking at, is it even allowed? So we look at zoning regulations, and uh, fortunately, uh, the, the three sites that we took a look at, this one and the other two, uh, zoning regulations allow for this type of construction on each of the properties. I'm just gonna point out, uh, we are here at the existing facility, and the other two sites that we looked at, uh, one up here at 70 Cedar Street, and the other across uh, the road over here at uh, 80 Haynes or Route 15. And you know, one major uh, in, important part is uh, accessibility, not only in terms of how people are gonna be mobile on the site, but how do they get there from around the town? So um, zoning is not the only uh, uh, piece that we look at. Very complicated uh, uh, factors. They go in a lot of technical factors, including drainage. How, the, how is it gonna be permitted? Um, Traffic is always a big concern uh, every time we look at uh, something like this. How do people get to the site? How do they leave the site? Is it gonna be uh, safe to access the main roads uh, that, they're, that you're turning onto? Um, are there any flooding impacts uh, on each of the property? How does it impact the abutters? Uh, operational costs, we take a look at that as well. You know, Once you build something, 
now the staff has to maintain it and there's a cost associated with operating it uh, uh, moving forward in the future. A couple of other things, soil conditions, you know, is, it, is are the soils appropriate uh, on each site and are there any hazardous materials that are located uh, on each uh, property. Additionally, from the, the local uh, codes, there's a lot of state codes that we have to abide by. You know, I'm not going to read them all off here, but there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of information that we have to digest and make sure that we are properly informing the town on uh, that we're going to meet all the applicable codes. And specifically, uh, special considerations with a uh, uh, type three B construction. Rates. Would you want to address that? So this is this existing building um, because it's an existing building would require additional work to be brought up to code. It would be grandfathered in, if you will, because we're building a sizable addition on the back of it that triggers upgrades. And it just is consideration to take when evaluating each site. So the, once we kind of digest all of that information and we take uh, some of the information that uh, comes from BH plus A, uh, we put together a very conceptual uh, uh, plan for the site. Uh, this is the existing site here. This is 480 Main Street. Uh, the existing building would remain uh, as is, and as Rachel mentioned, a, a building addition to the rear of that uh, to accomplish the goals that uh, would be needed here. Um, you'll see a little bit later in the slide that in order to accomplish that, uh, the, the traffic study suggests that 88 parking spaces would be required um, to accommodate that. Currently, the site has 26 spaces on it. When we said, okay, how, how can we accomplish that? Can we get 88 spaces on here? The first thing we had to do was uh, expand parking out into the green space out in front, uh, closer to the road. Uh -oh. uh, we had to expand the parking, it is not like me. We had to expand the parking forward uh, out towards Main Street to uh, supply a couple of extra parking spaces there. And even at maximizing the space required on the site, uh, we end up with a total of 66 spaces that this site we feel could accommodate. A couple of other things that we are suggesting, uh, at least on this conceptual plan, you currently have an entrance here. It's a little confusing with a one-way sign on it. Uh, for people that use it every day, it's probably no problem, but for people coming for the first time, you know, do you come in that way? Are you allowed to come in that way? It's a, just a little bit confusing. Um, and also, uh, where people come in at that one entrance, they also exit at that same entrance and its proximity to Main Street there, uh, what we found was that some of the, the cars that are trying to access Main Street, they're backing up on that street at certain times of day. So you, you sort of approach this uh, um, exit uh, driveway right here. So we've, we've suggested, uh, you know, perhaps we take a look at uh, adding a one way in on down here and the one way out uh, up, up a little further there. Kind of pull that away from Main Street. We feel that that might be a little bit of more appropriate. Um, this uh, site here, I'll show you a couple of other things here. It includes a kind of a larger plaza area off to the uh, one side here. Uh, it brings uh, ADA parking closer to the building so you're not having to travel across. Currently, there's a, what, what I have seen on this side here is the ADA access is on the rear of the building, which is also the north side of the building. So what that typically means in the winter time, snow removal is a challenge, I would imagine, out there and you know, keeping it ice free is a big challenge. It's always in the shaded side of the building on the north side. Uh, that's not really where you want your ADA access, you know, where, where it's very icy and slippery all the time. So, um, you know, this improves some of that ADA access to it as well. And any questions on this site plan before I move on to another? So we, we've kind of reorganized the parking along here. We've kind of expanded it primarily towards Main Street, but we did widen it a little uh, on, on each side of the building to try to improve the circulation around there. So again, this site currently has 26 spaces. This uh, plan shows 66 spaces. Okay. So just 40 more spaces overall. Uh, just wondering the front. I see there's on someone's side there. So okay. what we're showing it, so I'm sorry. What we're showing in front of the building here is 6, 14, 21, 30 spaces in front of that. Thank you. If you consider uh, 
the acquisition of the Goodrow parcel to the rear. The uh, town was, had requested that, that, uh, that the Goodrow parcel uh, be, in, be investigated for additional parking. So I can't really answer that question because we did not consider that as part of what we were given to evaluate. What we did is okay. we kept we kept that all on this parcel here. Well, it was it was requested at the beginning of the study. It, it was that be it was not requested. We talked about it at the end of the study, and we can at some point acquire that if the board so wants to, when the town so wants to. But we were tasked with looking at the existing site. I was on the board and. It, it was discussed before the start of the study. There's also a retaining wall. Yeah, so uh, a couple of other things I just want to point out here, uh, Robin, thank you for that. Uh, what, this sh what this shows here is because the front of this parcel was getting lower and lower in topography, in order to have a flat parking space out front, you have a relatively large retaining wall out here, which might change the aesthetics a little bit on Route 20 some special consideration on how that would be built and what that looks like um, it should be should be considered and we have a um, what we're showing here is to maintain the pedestrian connection to the sidewalks out here we're showing a sidewalk down here and then a ramp system out in front to access that the good rural parcel would have eliminated the need for all that retaining walls and everything because the parking would be in the rear yes sir now with this conception here you're still going to have two floors, is what you were trying to get away from in the first place. Yeah, I'll let Rachel address that a little bit here. Yeah, so yes, this the receipt building is two stories. So even if we built a one story addition onto the back of this center, you would still have a two story facility. And I have plans towards the end of this presentation that go through the interior of each proposed um, option, and we can get into how this building would be laid out in a little more detail then. So the last piece that I, I wanted to just say real quick, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, is that um, this plan contemplates a loading zone back towards the rear of the building here, uh, which also aligns with uh, exiting from the building, and we, we laid that out that way for that consideration. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, I was wondering, does this square footage of this proposal meet what you were looking for for the, I think it was 12,000? Yeah, it yeah, does. Yes, it does. Actually, I have another question. Sure. How far out to this side does it go? Because there's, it, it would require fill, definitely, and there's a stream um, that runs out there. So. so I forget the exact uh, foot, but it does uh, go over seven, eight feet, I believe, pushes oh, it further right. that way. Oh, but right. it, it would impact uh, uh, what we call the swale on that side of there. Mm -hmm. So the drainage that comes there, there's some drainage that comes from the rear back here. Right. We would have to pick all of that up and um, tie that into some drainage. When you're, when you're putting some additional impervious area or parking lot area up front, part of what we would have to do during the design would be to accommodate that to make sure that you know, you're not flooding off uh, downstream, not only for this front parking area, but also for you know all the, uh, the stuff coming from the, from the rear and the side. Just for a little bit of context, this property line right here is the La Quinta Suites on the side. Their pavement of their driveway is up to the property line. There's no space. Oh, so you have a car length between the front of your car and the next car in the La Quinta space. So that's pretty much what will happen through there. And then in terms of the rear property, um, the neighbor who lives in, in her house here, Goudreau, which is what Mr. Supernaut is referring to, um, that is a smaller property that goes up just off the page and then goes here and this is her driveway um, that accesses off of Arnold Road and that's all she has there is the one access point. So, so I get, I got it too far ahead. So it's a, it's a smaller addition to the back and it also goes uphill. Thank you. All right, so I'll move on to the other two sites and we can circle back uh, with any other questions you may have at the end. Figure this out before the end. <laughs> uh, so the other two sites will start with uh, 80 Hain Street. It's on the other side of the highway over there. Uh, it's located on Hain Street, uh, commonly referred to as Route 15. 
it is a pretty big wide open site over there uh, but it does have a number of constraints there you see all of the green areas in here are some kind of environmental constraint flood zone wetland area uh, conservation uh, restriction uh, it also has quite a bit of topography on the site over there um, you know which is not insurmountable but it kind of limits where we might think about placing the building on the site so a large portion of the site over here all of that site is uh, is very difficult to build on very difficult to get permitted so what we've shown here is tucking this parcel all the way up here in the corner what's a little bit interesting about this property is that uh, the street here has a the street here has the property line is pretty far off of the road itself um, so what we uh, working with the town uh, the first concept that we put out here showed all of the um, building on the property itself uh, we were asked to pull that property down a little bit closer to the road there uh, because So we, we pulled this down a little bit closer to the road there, thinking that um, we may not have to reserve the property adjacent to the roadway for future roadway construction. Uh, just make it a little, bit, a little bit easier to build on there. What we're showing here is to compare apples to apples. I said that a traffic study um, kind of uh, said 88 spaces would be required for the code. Uh, what we're trying to do here is show 66 spaces and what it would look like here because 66 spaces uh, is what we had shown on the existing site. We wanted to compare apples to apples on the other sites as well. Uh, what this site does have is it has some additional areas that we feel would be appropriate to expand the parking uh, if we needed to, uh, to accommodate that extra parking on that side over there. But the primary takeaway here is the uh, amount of um, environmental uh, issues on this site. When I say environmental, I'm not necessarily many hazardous materials. I'm mainly uh, referring to wetlands, floodplains, those type of things. You see we've got a 200 foot river front here. The river is on this side. So that provides some restrictions. All the green uh, has wetlands and other things. There is a floodway that comes all the way up onto the property here from the adjacent uh, property. So uh, again, a lot of uh, constraints that are there. But what this is showing is a building here, circulation around, parking out the front uh, adjacent to the roadway for 66 spaces. What is the white part? I'm sorry. What, the white what? area that's between the green and the... Here? Yeah. Uh, so we, we try to consolidate the uh, development as, as close to the building as we could. Could you expand out in that area? Potentially you could um, if, if needed. But again, the topography makes that a little bit more challenging. The more you expand that out there, the more cut, more walls, more other different uh, costs that you're going to have to consider. Any other questions on this site here before I move on? What is the elevation topography anyway? What's the difference in relative heights? And I mean, so uh, this is. I just uh, want to compare it to some of the other sites. I mean, we're saying we have a big topography here. You said we have to put an eight foot wall to approximately at the front of the street here. Th this is about a 20 foot drop from this point here to this and point. How here. far is that distance? Um, 200 feet? Yeah, 200. Yeah, that's, that's about right. So, so it roughly twice what, what we see here, I would say, on this yeah, side. Yeah, this site's probably only 100, though. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Does this area have a conservation restriction on it? So we, we've been round and round on that. Uh, yes, there is a conservation restriction on there. There would have to be some special consideration to abandon that, con that, that uh, easement uh, restriction in order to make this is happen. It, is How it long would that take? Trust? What's that? How long does that typically take? And is it it's a it's a good question. It it's not a short process, I would imagine. And yeah. and is it usually successful? Yes, Let me. Uh, my name is Jeff Bridges. I'm the town administrator. I'll, I'll take that question. Um, there's a conservation restriction on this property. Uh, the holder of the conservation restriction is Opaque Land Trust. In order to lift that restriction, first and foremost, Opaque Land Trust would have to agree to that. Secondly, town meeting would have to agree to that. Then the state DEP would have to agree to that. 
then you would need special legislation from the state legislature to lift that easement. My understanding is it's never been done throughout the entire state with these restrictions. So why and the last, wait a minute, let me finish, let me finish, sir. And the last message we got from the Board of Selectmen was that it was going, uh, they weren't supportive of that process at this point for this parcel. So, and your other question, I'm sorry. Why would you even put that into the feasibility study? We were asked to review this site for the applicability of this use. Well, whoever asked you should not have the job anymore because there's no, the, no reason, there was no, nobody would agree to it. Why would you ask inside the town hall if we could pass this? On this we were, site, you just said the Board of Selectmen wouldn't even agree to it. The, this site was offered up as consideration for the site. The Board of Selectmen chose to add three sites to this study, the existing site, 70 Cedar Street, and the Shepherd Parcel, which okay. is what this now, is. Out of the 120 that the town owns, you picked this one with the conservation restriction. That is almost impossible to get past. I understand it's a little, it's it's a little just stacked on the deck. I don't That's know about stacking the deck, but we were asked to staff to review this parcel for the applicability of the solution. Okay, so that one should have been thrown off the table by anybody who looked at it. Should have been like, we have all this restriction, we can't get it passed through the but, state, the town, the board of selectmen. There's so much that we have to go through that we shouldn't even put that one out the, there. The question of applicability had to do with the physical ability of the site to sustain the senior center, not the restrictions on it. Right. And we proved and the engineering proves that the site can physically it can support I, I agree that it can support it, but out of the 120 pieces that the town owned, we could have picked a better one. Anybody that looks at the town records and pulls it up, you could look at a better piece the, than the that. The Senior Center Study Committee spent five years looking for a parcel. Okay. And these are the and that's three, the one they come up with. These are the, the three that were, we have 1,800 acres of owned land in the town. These three parcels are the most suitable for a senior center, or for any other project we may you know, we may look towards in the future. And, and, and I think if I can, uh, yeah, the uh, what we were tasked with doing is looking to say, physically, can we? Is it feasible to actually construct a senior center on this particular parcel? And you know, I think what we've come up with here in our conceptual plan is yes, it is feasible. There are some restrictions. There are some hurdles that would definitely need to be. Uh, taken under, but that wasn't part of this initial scope. Here. You know, that might be the next round here. If, apart from all the other restrictions there, if, if you know the town said yes, let's move forward with that. You know, that's a process that needs to go through in order to make that happen. Is it insurmountable? Sounds like it's going to be tough, but I don't know if it's insurmountable. But that's what our scope was really look physically. Can we build it on So this is that. This is the um, uh, the what we can. You know the. Result of that, Jesus. I think it's a great problem. location, though. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah, what, I think at Route 15 is a great location. Mm -hmm. And what one uh, you, you'll see in a, another side, we kind of compare all three of them side by side and some pros and cons here. Um, we take a look at uh, when folks come out here and access the main road. There, you know, are there any sight distance issues? You know, is it around a curve? Is it over the top of a hill? This site does not have any of those. It's nice and wide open. One challenge on this is that the speed seems to be a factor. You know, people are driving pretty fast, and uh, two things uh, we typically look at uh, leaving a senior center in particular, the volume of the cars on the road, how much traffic is there, and how fast are they going? Because both of those impact typically seniors leaving the site. You know, if they're Did driving- they do a traffic study on? They actually put traffic study out on those roads, on the roads? Uh, we, we reviewed existing traffic studies that were there, and you know, we did on-site evaluations of cars coming by. During COVID? Uh, prior to COVID, this was, this was about a year ago now, I think. A year ago, a year and a half ago. A year, year and a half ago, I think, is when we started. Before COVID. It was before COVID. All right, so I'm, I'm going to the next site here. Figure it out. So the third site that we uh, took a look at is 70 Cedar Street. Uh, Cedar Street is out front here, um, heading down this direction to Main Street, down just off of the screen here. Um, uh, Karen Street is just to the north here, and Cedar Pond Road is just to the south on this on the plan. Uh, initially, uh, we took a look at uh, access to the site from two separate uh, locations one being from Cedar Pond Road, 
uh, the other being from Karen Street. Uh, Karen Street is a privately owned road, so um, we had to pivot and move off of that pretty quickly um, because uh, it, it's very narrow, uh, very windy. It's not really uh, supportive of a uh, senior center traffic and buses and all the other things that are coming to it. So we, we took a look at accessing this from uh, Cedar Pond Road and what that meant. Uh, we had a lot of iterations on the site here, uh, trying to minimize the topography. Uh, this site does have a lot of topo topographic issues as well, um, and some ledge uh, out there. So uh, initially we started to take a look at where does this fit on the site to minimize the cuts and the fills and the costs associated with that. Uh, but it puts it all the way up here in the corner here, very close to uh, abutters. Uh, so our first iteration showed here's what we could do to um, kind of minimize some of the uh, cuts and fills. And uh, uh, through the process here, uh, we located more centrally located here. Uh, what we're showing here is a 100 foot wooded buffer around uh, the abutting properties. Um, we were asked to even inc increase that just a little bit more to 120 feet. Uh, so that's uh, kind of where we're showing this location right here. Uh, again, we're showing 65 spaces here only because that's the way the layout worked, but we're showing some ability to expand parking uh, just to the north and east of that if needed. Um, there's some other uh, projects that are currently in the works uh, adjacent on the adjacent parcel here. Although it's an adjacent parcel, they're both town owned. Uh, this is a, um, a, a field project that's happening right now and an associated parking lot. So. We took that into consideration when we were laying out where this is going to be located as well. Uh, this site has um, some wetlands on it on this side here, but primarily it's all upland, so it's a pretty nice location from an environmental standpoint to build it. Uh, the access is down onto uh, Cedar Pond Road. Uh, what we're showing that access, Cedar Pond Road is a pretty nice road, and then at the very end of it, it's kind of a little bit curvy there, so we are contemplating the driveway access to come to the, what we call the apex of the curve to make sure that we have enough sight distance uh, for people leaving. Uh, that road, then Cedar Pond Road, comes out to Cedar Street. Again, uh, we didn't find any uh, major uh, sight um, issues, sight, sight distance issues in looking up and down the road. Uh, speed doesn't appear to be a factor there, uh, predominantly in the volume is, uh, is relatively uh, minor. And when you come down Cedar Street, uh, that's the access down to Main Street. It is a signalized intersection, uh, so that really provides um, a good opportunity for people coming in and out of the site to get onto the main thoroughfares and go where they need to go. Uh, obviously, this site doesn't have an elder care bus. This site that I'm showing here doesn't have an elder care bus in it because there's, there's no site that's listed there. So that's something that would need to be uh, taken into consideration um, where, that, where the bus is coming from and if uh, site access is going to be impacted. Any questions on this side here? Yes, ma'am. Um, what's the consideration being given to the fact that there's no sidewalk access? Cedar Street is actually quite a dangerous road. It's curvy and hilly, and um, there's multiple bus stops on that road for Burgess and Tantaspera Junior and Senior High Schools. So what's the consideration be give, being given to sidewalk access? There is no sidewalk access on Cedar Pond Road. There are cars that line both of that road during summer recreational camps as well as basketball games, tennis matches, pickleball matches. So I think, and it's also a dead end road and um, for lake residents. So I'm curious as to why a dead end residential road <coughs> would be the right location. Yes, thank you. Um, so we know, the town knows, we have to provide sidewalks not only on Cedar Pond Road, but also on Cedar Street. Uh, the DPW director, is in the process of developing a plan to do this, the sidewalks on Cedar Street. We know we're gonna to have to rebuild Cedar Pond Road, rebuild to accommodate the drainage, the traffic, uh, and the parking. So what you see out there now for Cedar Pond Road will be substantially different when this project's done. It has to be to carry the traffic. Um, in addition to the field project, parking will be enhanced throughout the site to accommodate off-street parking so you're not having the congestion you have today. So with this senior center project, you're also going to get 
drainage and traffic enhancements in the same area to overcome some of those deficiencies you just mentioned. So that wouldn't be included in the $10 million cost on the building though, correct? No, it's other site costs we'd have to accommodate. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I've lived at 102 Cedar Street since 1985. The uh, bottom of Cedar Street was redesigned many years ago because they used to loop around. Put a traffic light in, cars will come from other directions on a road over. And, and, and I disagree with your comment on speeding. There's a big problem with speeding. I've had no less than six accidents right in front of my house. And it's constant. It's a dangerous road. People walk on it or jog on it, and the cars are speeding down. There's Burgess Elementary coming out of there. It's the, 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 and you're talking about another 65 cars or whatever. But to be concerned about there is a problem with speeding. Appreciate that input. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to add there's also a lot of climbed driveways that are blocking traffic. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Can we get a, a cost estimate for the required offsite improvements for this project? So that, um, for, you know, for the, before the town can decide, you know, which site to, you know, we, we should have an estimate of offsite improvements. So, so I think I heard, and I don't want to speak here, but I, I understand that those offsite improvements that uh, Jeff mentioned are independent of this project and are going to happen regardless or independent of Well, this? I think what, what we as uh, staff are look, looking at right now is you have two projects in the same area. I think both, either one independently needs Cedar Pond Road to be enhanced along with the sidewalks along Cedar Street. So we're looking at ways to come up with a cost estimate for Cedar Pond Road that we would include in either one of these two projects to enhance. But you're right, we would need the cost estimate in a proposed method of funding for that project before we propose this to the public. Yes, Do these include um, estimates for lighting as well? Because I would imagine this needs to be a significant amount of lighting and that's a, again a completely residential area. So what is the lighting impact and cost mm -hmm. to the project? They, they, yes. Um, so I'll move on here unless there's any other questions that anybody wants to ask. So I'll move on to what the traffic study said. As I mentioned earlier, um, what the program indicates is that the peak demand for the senior center is up, up to 88 parking spaces. You see that the three that we showed here, maximum of 66 on this site here. We utilize that number again for an apples to apples comparison in terms of cost. Um, this site here, Main Street, could reduce the demand to 73 spaces. Uh, due to the, its location and some of the other uh, amenities that are, are close by, uh, other transportation like the elder bus, like the walkability from the sidewalk down to downtown. You don't get that same uh, mobility to the downtown and adjacent areas from the other two sites. Uh, access, accessible uh, site distances uh, are we found to be at all three locations. Uh, that they, they weren't a, a deterrent or a, a deal breaker. None of the sites required uh, significant mitigation for safety considerations, apart from the sidewalks that uh, you know we're hearing on Cedar Pond Road. Um, the availability of an elder bus um, hasn't been evaluated quite yet, only because the other two sites don't exist. And uh, um, as I mentioned, only Main Street has uh, pedestrian accommodations that are suitable for um, this, this use here. The other two sites don't have that pedestrian connection to other sites. So this slide here kind of shows the side-by-side uh, -side comparisons here. Um, what we found was that 4D Main Street, which is the site that we are here, is the best location for proximity to pedestrian accommodations. Um, the elder bus uh, service currently exists to the site, which is a, a positive. Uh, no trends or severities of incident in the vicinity of the site that cause concern for patrons. You know, no significant accidents of immediately outside the front door here. Um, this will, uh, we're, we're presuming that the 66 spaces that we're showing here still uh, allow for uh, overflow parking on the other side of the street over here. Um, 
you know, that's currently how the parking demand is met in one of the 26 sites that we have here. They park at the adjacent sites uh, when, when the events or one of their programs are, are going on. Um, but there's a difficulty in expanding the, the site um, at this location for parking, is what we found. And uh, conflicts in repurposing the site while maintaining the current. Right? I think that that's an important uh, note that if this were having an addition built on there, there's some logistical concerns of how the program is going to be maintained and be ongoing while some of this construction is going on. Uh, 70 Cedar Street has no pedestrian accommodation. The curbing uh, roadway may be a, a bit of a challenge for the elder bus service. Uh, it does have adequate sight distance. Uh, again, uh, no trend in severe uh, incidents in the vicinity of the site. It's a large property which allows for ample parking over there potentially. Uh, there are no nearby options for overflow parking, uh, with the exception of this new um, field that's coming in and maybe some parking that's coming there. You know, while we were going through this program, that program was going on there too. So it was, which is coming first? Is that going to come? Is that not going to come? So if that if that program didn't come, there was no uh, additional overflow parking, and uh, it's currently unoccupied property uh, that will not interrupt the current council on aging. Uh, operation, you know, you could build that site over there without really impacting the operations and the logistics that are going on here. 80 Haines Street, again, no pedestrian accommodation. Uh, speeds along Route 15 are higher than, um, you know, what, what I would certainly like. Uh, you know, while we were out there visiting, there was some, some very fast traveling that was going down there. Uh, adequate sight distance, though, you can see up and down that road for a long way and, you know, have, have a confidence to pull out onto that street. Um, it is a large property that allows for ample parking with all of the other restrictions that are in place there. Kind of constrains that a little bit, uh, but it does have the ability to support 66 spaces with some additional spaces uh, brought in. And again, uh, much like 70 Cedar, it's unoccupied, so you can construct that property without impacting the operations that are going on here. I think that, that that wraps me up here. I'll turn it back over to Rachel and uh, you'll circle back at the end here to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks. I'm going to stand over here so I can close the I learned not to hold it. <laughs> totally new perspective on the other side of the room. So I'm going to go through the um, conceptual plans we did. We did two options. We did a reuse of this site here, which includes renovating the existing building and providing an addition on the rear. And then a second option was a one-story new construction senior center, which could be accommodated on either one of the new construction sites. So two building plans um, were proposed, were, de were developed for um, your consideration. Uh, so this is the proposed adaption or renovation of the existing 480 site. So what we have here, I'll just walk you through yellow anything in yellow is circulation so like stairs hallways elevator um, anything in like this um, light green is um, support spaces like bathrooms the olive green are office spaces and the orange is program spaces so i think the first thing that jumped out at me is that there's a sizable addition at the rear of the building right here is our existing elevator and our existing stair this wall here is the wall that we're looking at here. So this is basically your existing building here and everything behind is new construction. It's the addition at the back. And most of that new construction, most of that new addition is a large 2,000 square foot multi-purpose room. So to give you an idea of how big that is, this room here is about 1,000 square feet. So it's twice that size, roughly. Don't hold me to those exact numbers. I don't know exactly how big this room is, but I'm gonna wager it's about 1,000 square feet. So the entry sequence to this building would be relocated as well. Instead of using the stairs that are at the front of the building, you would park along the side and there'd be a new main entry with a generous vestibule and a really nice large lobby, a large reception desk, all meant to welcome you to this great new facility. I don't that know. Wasn't that wasn't the intention. <laughs> you will, you will touch you. Um, so, so you're coming in from the side, Big, beautiful open lobby, big, beautiful reception area for um, people to mingle, get information that they need, and then go to this really large multi-purpose room that's at the rear. These dashed lines are indicating operable partitions, so again, the space can be subdivided as you need it. 
Um, then directly adjacent to it in pink is this commercial kitchen, which is about 450 square feet. So you can imagine it's about half the size of this room to give you an idea of how big. Um, and it's associated with a loading dock and um, a ramp to get things in and out for that kitchen. Kitchens often have lots of deliveries. It's, it's nice to have that loading area. This, uh, this design proposes keeping the existing elevator and the existing stair at the back. Um, and then the inside of the downstairs would be reconfigured. We would get rid of the historic stair that's at the front. We would use that for durable medical equipment storage. We would have offices along the side, so they have glass and visibility to the parking lot. And then in the center would be a restroom core with large restrooms that are all accessible. So that's the ground floor for this proposed option. And then the second story. On the second story, Above the multi-purpose room would be more program space. It would be another large room that's subdividable. And then you would have a smaller workout room with um, workout equipment, some additional offices and meeting rooms, and then your game room with your billiard table. So this part here is a one-story portion of it that just has the kitchen and its floating dock area. Everything else is two stories. Um, this is the one-story new construction proposed option. And again, this works at any of the new construction sites that we looked at. So main takeaway or big difference is it's one story, has no stair or elevator. That can be really great for um, accessibility, obviously for those that are mobility impaired, stairs and even elevators can be difficult to navigate. Elevators can also be a maintenance issue, so there are always a pro and a con to either. Um, and I will say for a smaller center like this, you know, there's about 12,000 square feet, one story is good. When you start to get bigger, sometimes a one story option can just feel really like long and like the hallways go on forever and you get disoriented. But for this size, for 12,000 square feet, a one story option works well. So for this design, we have a port couchere, like a, um, a sheltered area where a bus or drop off people can pull up. Again, a vestibule and a generous lobby. Um, that gift shop has a dedicated area right off of the lobby as this reception. This is kind of like a central node. Everyone comes in here and then goes um, either side to whatever particular program or assistance they need. So from the lobby, you go in this direction to access all of the support spaces, the staff, the outreach coordinator, the veterans office as well as the core that contains the restrooms. And then this is all just kind of back of house stuff like mechanical spaces. Um, you're gonna have a sprinkler in either building and that always needs space for its, you know, for its equipment. Um, and then right off that lobby as you're coming in, you look directly across to is again, this beautiful large multi-purpose room with a big divider curtain. And in this version, we have the space to associate it with a patio. So it would have a nice outdoor terrace connected to that multi-purpose room. So a really lovely connection to the outdoors. Um, and then immediately, if you're coming in the lobby and then you choose to go to the left, you've got your game room, your workout room, and then that other large um, physical activity space. So in terms of program size, both options are the same size, the spaces are roughly the same size. The main difference is one is 100% new construction, this one story option, and it's one story. So again, there's not the circulation associated with a two story building, your stairs, your elevator, um, those sort of things. Did anyone have questions about the designs? And then I'll, otherwise I'll move on to the fun stuff, the money. I would have one question and it's going to pertain to exactly what you're going to talk to about right now. Okay. If that's the number that you put out a year ago, it's totally false. Doing construction for a living, I can tell you that that number is definitely not that. There is the there, there is definitely a lot of fluctuation at the moment because of COVID. COVID has definitely thrown some curveballs to the construction industry, and it duly acknowledged. Um, so for a feasibility study, we look at the program, we figure out how big a building you need, and then we say, okay, what is the cost associated with that size? And for different sites, there are different costs. One site might have more site costs associated with it. For example, it might need a septic system whereas another site might be able to use town sewer. Those are just examples, but just to illustrate the idea that different sites have different costs associated with them. 
A one-story option doesn't have the cost of an elevator. A two-story option does. In this case, that's moot because we're reusing the elevator. But just to explain that there are different costs associated with different options, different sites carry different costs. So our job was to look at the three sites that we were given and the different buildings that would go with each site and say, okay, what are the costs associated? And so I'm just gonna move over here for a second. So for 40 Main Street, the first one here, I'm just gonna go line by line to go through these items. So you have construction cost estimate with escalation. And all that means is at the time when this estimate was put together, they added a percentage more anticipating the costs would fluctuate and be different when this actually was going to be constructed. So that base cost was 7.7 million for 40 Main Street. For 70 Cedar was 7.8 million. And for Heinz, it was 7.5. So all roughly within 10% of each other. Then the next line item is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So this is everything that goes inside the building. Everything that is not, <coughs> not physically part of the building. So you have your furniture. Those are all gonna be comparable across the project because they're all the same program, they're all the same size. Likewise, your AV equipment, your beautiful new TVs, those things too would be the same across all the projects. Um, there were different items that we were looking for for the multi-purpose room to be what we're calling broadcast ready, like lights and cameras for an event like today. Again, same across all. Office equipment, same across all. Kitchen equipment, there's a lot of kitchen equipment that goes into a commercial kitchen. But again, each site has the same size commercial kitchen, so those costs were all comparable. Um, then you have items like um, the phone system. Even if we were to stay here and reuse this building, we wouldn't anticipate upgrading the phone system. So those costs were the same against or across each site. Fitness equipment likewise, office supplies, and um, AV equipment that's outside of the program rooms. I don't know why it's itemized differently, but it is. So suffice it to say, the construction costs are slightly different. The costs of the furniture and equipment, all comparable. And then the one thing I just want to point out is that the new sites require a transformer. That's the $15,000 line item up there. But at the same time, there's another line item down here for re relocation costs for this building. So in other words, for this building or for, this, for the senior center to be fully operational throughout construction, this building would have to be moved and recited to a temporary location. There are costs associated with that. Um, the rest of the costs that are here are what we call soft costs. They have nothing to do with the building, they all have to do with the design and its operations. So for example, the architecture fee, what you pay us to design the building, that's accounted for here. Then you have testing and inspections, project management for public buildings in Massachusetts, the town would hire what they call an owner's project manager or OPM. That's someone that basically oversees the construction, manages both the contractor and the architect. Um, then you have the moving costs I had mentioned. You have really, really negligible costs associated with legal um, aspects of building a pro public project. And then at the bottom, we have a line item for contingency. Contingency is basically just extra money in case something comes up, and that we have is 5% five, uh, and that's 5% of all the other costs. So it starts to get different because you have percentages taken of a base cost and the base costs are slightly different. Bottom line, these are the estimated costs for each one of the sites. So for 40 Main Street, the estimated cost is 9.9 .9 million. For Cedar Street, it's 10 million. And for Haines Street, it's 9.6, 9.7. Um, so that, to go back to the point about costs during COVID, there are some there is some volatility, if you will, in the market at the moment. We've had various projects go out to bid, come under. We've had various projects go out to bid, go over. We rely on our cost estimators who have been in this business for decades to give us good estimates. And the estimator that we work with has a very good track record. Um, any questions about the estimate? So it's not taking into account that current construction materials costs are up possibly about 40 to 50 percent? So the, the issue we're having right now with COVID is it's volatile. So there are ups and downs. And our project, we're, we're not going to bid now. We're not going to bid six months from now. And so when we develop this project, what happens is we will develop a schematic design, which is basically taking this conceptual design and developing it that much further, 
giving more specificity to, for example, do we have an asphalt roof or a metal roof or a rubber roof? Those kind of details get worked out in SD. Those SD designs then get estimated again by a cost estimator. Oftentimes we'll have two cost estimators that will come together and do a reconciliation. That adds more credibility to their results. After SD, we can elect to do further estimates based on what that cost comes in at. And then there's also always the option to do what we call value engineering, which is to look at the design and say, oh, we came in $100,000 over budget, or we came in $50,000 over budget. What can we change to the design that will allow us to get back within budget? Because ultimately, our job as a designer is to design within the budget of the project. Okay. You're setting $10 million as your budget. That is what we design within. We respect that very faithfully. So basically you're saying that there would be cuts in the designs. No, I'm not saying that. To be clear, what I'm saying is that there is discussions about how you can work within that budget. And it might be, for example, instead of putting a metal roof on, we decide to do an asphalt roof. Or it might be that you say, I'm going to designate an alternate to the project. And when it goes out to bid, that's going to be bid separately. And if the bids come in low, we can adopt it. There are various strategies to come in within budget. But long story short, there will be another estimate that will happen when this project is in full design, and we will have an opportunity to revisit that estimate then. But our job, again, is to work within the budget. Right, and they could be completely different than what you're showing. They could be higher, they also could be lower. There's just a lot of volatility right now. Let me, let me just add something to that. So what, what we really see here is the fact that there's no clear option that is financially different than another option. So that's that's very clear. Even given escalation in prices and the market and all those good things, there's not one clear winner when it comes to the cost of the project. So at some point, we will do a new cost estimate based upon current market conditions before we ask the public to allocate X yep. amount of funds for the project. So we know that that market's changing. The unfortunate thing is COVID put this project behind a little bit so we know that some of these numbers may need to be updated before we get to asking the public to borrow XYZ dollars. What we're saying today is, looking at the numbers, either any of the options are very similar in terms of total cost, even with any escalations up or down. I tend to disagree only because if it's on Cedar Street, um, we have to redo completely Cedar Street to put in a sidewalk, which means um, sewerage, sewerage um, electric lines, uh, mitigating all of the, the runoff. Um, there are wetlands in that area as well mm -hmm. as Cedar Pond itself. All of that takes a lot of engineering and all of those costs will inflate as well as construction costs. Well, if we believe that that road will be included in the cost of the, of the building that may be paid for otherwise. And we have a field project going on as well that needs that road also. So there's some synergy between some projects that may provide different opportunities for these improvements. Senior centers are often designed uh, for disaster preparedness. I don't see anything in the estimate for standby power, um, emergency hospital beds and things like that that are often included in the budget for a for, and that's one of the things that it, I've seen in, in the uh, senior centers that I've been involved in the construction yep. with those things get deleted at the last minute because of cost but uh, we're not talking about even considering disaster preparedness <coughs> for our senior center at this point is that uh, am I correct or so Robin did that ever come up in previous conversations that I've I'm not aware of or um, I believe all the options have a generator which we don't have right now to be a heating or cooling or emergency shelter here we do not have an emergency generator um, so that is something we would do no matter what we did building a new site mm -hmm. um, but the, we have the advantage in Sturbridge you guys have an emergency management coordinator who works with the police department um, under chief deserve and the emergency management coordinator is always on the lookout. Um, the good thing about emergency things is there's a lot of grant opportunities, a lot of options for funding out there for that department to then work with us as we sort of tweak designs and, and do other things um, to, to bring the building to fruition, right? One of the important things that Rachel said is that this 
project, this feasibility study was very much a test fit. Can we do it? And which one of these should we do, right? If it had come back and it said one of these options was $3 million and the others were 11, we wouldn't be having so much discussion, right? We would all know where we would be headed. And so what happened for the committee is that they had a very tough challenge, right? They were hoping to have some easy answers come right to their doorstep. And that unfortunately didn't happen with the sites that were available and all the efforts that they put forward. Um, you can go to the ship. next slide. It's my turn anyway. Yep. So when the committee reviewed everything that we saw here today, right, they wanted to make sure they put together a series of spreadsheets, a series of checklists, spent several meetings going back and forth. Did each site give us the 12,000 square feet we needed? Yes, each option did. We requested at least 65 parking spaces, which is how we designed the site layouts and the gray pavement that you can see on the site plans. So each option checked that box. And then user-friendly and safe environment for the growing senior population, that was definitely an essential item. So they looked at, the committee looked at program goals, right? Um, so that's uh, everything that Leslie works hard here to do. Scheduling exercise classes, crafts, memory cafes to support dementia programs, all of those individual program goals, um, SNAP benefits for people of any age, not just the senior population in town, the fuel assistance program, right? Can, can this building, these programs support all of that? And the answer was pretty much yes, right? Now that we have a new option. Building goals, they looked at the different building goals for each site. They wanted to know, can it be an emergency site? Can it support some of the other functions? Can it grow, right? Cities and towns are constantly growing. Can it grow? If we were to build here in 30 years, when we have double the population again, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have to do this all over again. But the opportunities that were present at a new construction site meant that that site was viable for a very long time after this, as opposed to looking at a very limited short time frame. Um, and community benefits, right? So they looked at each site with a variety of community benefits. Um, one of the benefits, and some of the benefits discussed about here is obviously the location, right? Walkable to Main Street present on Main Street, the ability for people to walk from some of the housing developments in the neighborhood, to walk Main Street, to stay in that commercial development. If we could double the size of this parcel right now, you know, that would be great. Um, but Cedar Street offered another interesting opportunity, and, and that's where a lot of senior programs are headed in towards some multi-generational opportunities, recreation opportunities. We're seeing a lot of the younger seniors that are coming in using programs, looking for computer programs, looking for kayaking. Do you have the opportunity to paddle boat as a group? Can we do that as a group? Well, right here we can't, but Cedar could bring in some of those other interesting opportunities for some of the seniors and the request for programs. So there's a very sh a big shift in what the seniors of, of yesterday, today, what I'm gonna use, what my daughter's gonna use, that changes every time that you build a senior center. So for senior centers, they have to be ageless. They have to evolve. Um. <coughs> so that was some of the things that they did on, on Cedar, and that was why we did some of the layout questions, right? The first layout had us close to Seneca Lane, committee wanted to be further away. 100 feet of solid woods all the way around. Um, oh, go ahead and click it, should you? Oh, there we go. So you can see in gray, the Karen Road, the roads themselves. The white space is the right of way that's plotted out for those roads. The green space is what we gave them as a mandatory buffer. We're not gonna go 100 feet, right? And then we added some other buffers in here for our wetlands buffers, which are all on this side of the site. So then we looked at what we could do and where we would be. 
So everything green would still be green, right? That's your forest, that stays your forest. The impact of this site is here. And then worst case, as you start to grow and need more parking spaces or these other things, if we decide to do town elections at the building, some of those other opportunities where we may be paying money to other places right now, where we could save that money as a town in the total budget. That would all, that would be the worst case for development we'll see into that. Is there a, and that's the committee recommended site plan. The date, um, how this is gonna affect the camps that go on there during the summertime, because those kids run back and forth across those roads, but you have a lot of traffic going through there for any kind of election or, well, these are summer programs, but how does that impact the camps that are gonna be there? So that's one of the reasons why um, my role is not only facilities manager, but owner's project manager for the town to start to work with the town administrator and bring departments together as a group. We have, we have a senior center, we have our example, we know what we can do here. It's a buildable site. That was what problem one, number one we needed to solve. Um, meanwhile, recreation was looking to solve their own problem and challenge. They needed another field. They were tasked with finding a place to put an artificial turf field. Finance doesn't want anything but artificial, right? We're so really that was a, not there. We're a task. Really not here to talk field stuff. Right. right. But so that's the process that we've all now begun. This feasibility study is done. Recreation has done some of their test fits right. to see what fits there. Now we have all department heads. In fact, you know, yesterday again, we all had a group meeting, talking with planning, talking with conservation. We're starting to develop all that simultaneously while we're having these public meetings for you all. So hopefully answer all those questions for when we get to the point. Oh. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just curious. It, it doesn't sound really that there's been a full assessment from a conservation perspective. It seems like a lot of those times plans get voted in and, and then full conservation assessments are done. There are wetlands in that area. There are many things that have not yet been evaluated. So when is conservation step in? Our neighborhood has reached out to conservation multiple times and has not heard back. So it would be great to understand when conservation is going to be part of this mix because conservation is actually currently working with the Cedar Lake Association about the runoff from the Mass Pike. So it would be interesting why conservation wouldn't be opposed to a project like this since it's going to increase stormwater runoff, and salt, sand that gets and 70 Cedar is in the groundwater protection district. We know that. We're the town. We're not exempt from any requirements. So this early stage process, again, just make sure that it's something viable. And then the next part that comes are those details, the calculations of all that management, exactly where it runs, reviewing those with conservation. We still have to go through a design process, and we have to take that to conservation for their approval. We have to take it to site plan for their approval. And we know that site plan knows about the other projects too, and that's why we're all coming together now at this point to start work together and make sure we can accommodate that. I would also like to say that that, that area of land also supports an immense amount of wildlife. And also Cedar Street, there are many, many residential neighborhoods that are already contending with bus traffic from the schools and the rec area. This additional um, sports field and, and this senior center would add to that burden. They already have a tough time getting in and out of their driveways on Cedar Street. So part of the benefit of Sturbridge is you also have complete streets. I believe several years ago, and I wish Jean Bouvon were here um, today, and, uh, and Butch to, to help us speak with this, as I'm not up to speed on complete streets. But there's been a series of plans put in place for where sidewalks are needed, where road widening is needed, traffic control, and all of those things are part of an ongoing plan through the DPW. Um, and they know that because there is activity in this area and the way that the plan was written to prioritize things, they knew from that plan originally that Cedar Street was a priority. So those are also in the works. And again, that's part of bringing the departments together so that when we come to you, and we ask for whatever we're going to ask for, whenever we're going to ask for that, we hopefully have a cohesive answer at the time. But we are taking all of these questions today, I'm taking notes in the corner, um, receiving emails through the contact, we're making sure that we record all of these questions that come in, 
And those are the questions that we're asking each other and we're working through. The other question I have about 70 Cedar Street is when that road was developed, Karen Road, when they did the subdivision on the left-hand side, pretty sure the right hand side was given to the town as open space does that mean that they can take the open space and do whatever they want with it uh, that's before my time here but yeah, to the best what, of it's my information in it was not given as any set items such as shepherd which was given as well open so space. if you talk to some of the residents some that have lived there and bought there originally from the builder the builder told them that he had to give the property to the town as open space so I don't understand how if they're given property for open space, how they can take open space and develop it to whatever they want. That would mean in any one of these developments where the town, when you do a development, you have to give the town a certain amount of space for open space. That means they can come in and put a senior center right in your, in your development. Is that true? I don't know. I'm just, I just figured I'd throw that we question check the deed. We can check it. We can check with the open space committee and the open <coughs> space plan and, and the town planner to do that. That's the first time I've heard that question. So we definitely take that one back. We, we I mean, that could have been the builder yeah. saying that he had to turn it for open space and he did. Yeah. And somehow, most likely, I would have guessed that the town probably bought it for a dollar to cover themselves. Usually I, I, that's what happens and I've seen that. I've seen that too. So. Big right. discussion, right? right? Along that whole Cedar Lake Drive, all the whole area. Can I, can I just ask, uh, what, what specific property are you talking about? 70. 70. Okay. 70. Yeah. 70. We'll yep. just have to check to see if there's a deed restriction. Yeah. In our, in our research there, initially we didn't find anything on the deed research, okay. but, but thank you for that. For sure. right. I just, I figured I could just add to that. Yeah. I'm actually one of the houses that was developed on Karen Road. Um, and the, when the, we were looking for where to build and buy and disturbance, that was one of the things the realtor and the builder had told us. Basically just that across the street was going to be donated to the town as conservation as part of the development program and that we would never be looking at anything else. But again, this we, we were the original owner back in 2001. So if you guys could maybe look into that, that would probably be um, really helpful. But actually yet another part of my question, just from the last town meeting, I know that there was a feasibility study proposed again to look at this project that was voted, voted down and so where does that leave you as far as, is there another feasibility study that's still needed or in, so, part, in part of moving forward, how do you tackle that without having that study available? Yeah, so the article that was voted down included a request to do geotechnical borings on the site to make sure we knew exactly what the soils were so we could tweak those numbers. It included doing the traffic study that, um, and it included doing a site plan combined of both parcels together showing also the road improvements. That article did not go through. So now we don't have those that funds right now. That's part of our challenge, right? Well, they're tasked with, hired and tasked with dealing with 70, right? These guys down here in Macora, they're tasked with dealing with 60 and the field. So that's part of why I'm here and I'm trying to pull all these pieces together with what I can do without having that article funded. Let me, let me, let me add to that, please. Yep. Okay, so that article, primarily that <coughs> article was driven by the field design because 60 Cedar, and I know we're not talking about fields, but I just want to talk a little bit about the scope of what's going on here. 60 Cedar, although you have all these improvements on it, it's never been formally platted right, with a road and utilities and everything else. So, so planning and conservation went to the rec committee and said, hey, um, we need you to do that. So that's what generated that article to do that engineering. We can go forward with the field project and include those costs in the construction of the field. As we do permitting, same as this project here with the senior center, we know we're gonna have to do conservation and get permitting from conservation. Conservation has been in the middle of this project all along, knows what we've done, seen the plans. There's nothing that is fatal in what this shows in terms of conservation or planning but we do have to permit it, right? And that can be done as part of the design and construction of the project. So those funds would be included in those two projects to, to finish up, to plat 60, find the utilities, do all the studies and all those other things as part of the construction of these two projects. I would like to say that I think there is a conservation block because that 
those wood, that wooded area is an important recharge and filtration area for all of the surrounding neighborhoods well water. Understood. Understood. And we did this, the, these two plans, in particular the senior center, did include stormwater evaluation and how it's going to be captured and how it's going to be treated and all those other things. And, and if I may, this, this particular site is what they call a zone two wellhead protection zone. So there's very specific requirements when you move to that next level on what you can do and can't do with the design. So you have to build those protections in to meet the regulations that are associated with that wellhead protection zone. Okay, and so Eighty Canes, does that have as many residential neighborhoods who are on well water and support a lot of wildlife? Uh, no, area? it does not. It does not, okay, so that actually would be the better site. So it was a close call for the committee. Um, the committee recognized that new construction over the renovation here was really the best option for the program uses to move forward. Um, so then it came down for them to, to, to trying to choose to recommend one site to the board. Um, it came to 80 Haynes and to the 70 Cedar Street. Um, with some assistance from you know KP Law and, and understanding really the details during this process of that conservation restriction the really limited steps, the background research that our legal counsel has done for us to find out if, if removing the conservation restriction was viable, right? Really pushed, that was really, if there was no conservation restriction on that site, that was a very viable site. It would have been a septic system, it would have been its own well, it would not have been on public infrastructure like this site will be. Um, but that was the major distinction between the two sites, knowing that it could fit at both locations, it could work at both locations, and not, you know, thanks to the design team, we were able to figure that out. Um, and again, the cost, right? The costs were so close that we really, it came down to the waiting and the time and the unknown of the conservation restriction. That could mean we could be in the legal discussion for 10 years before we even talk about building at Hame Street. So basically what you're saying is you guys already chose 70. The committee chose 70 to recommend to the board of selectmen. Now the board of selectmen has to, and the finance committee and all those other places um, have to decide on how to do that. And as part of that, to make those decisions, we're having these public information meetings and we're doing these as informational, but then we'll also do a formal public hearing later. Okay, so can that, can, so you're recommending 70, but the Board of Selectmen, what if they recommend Haynes? Um, I think we heard earlier today, it's not impossible, nothing's impossible. Well, that's what I'm just saying. I mean, what if they choose a different site? What if they say we should, you're pushing, it sounds like you're pushing 70. You, your the, committee are pushing 70. The, 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 or, the, the search committee, the, the feasibility committee, we've been working on this close to seven years. <laughs> Their conclusion after reviewing all the data they've accumulated in the past seven years said, 70 seater is our spot. We okay. can get a one-story building, which is ideal for seniors. There, it's there's access. There's all kinds of good things. There's synergy with recreation. Okay. So they said 70. That's what they've recommended. And as Robin said, the board of selectmen received that recommendation. Now there's a process of educating the public not only about the different options, but about the costs. Right. At some That's point, why I was wondering if you're pushing 70, why are you telling everybody about all the other options? Well, we're not, not pushing, even, we're not even on the plate anymore. We're not pushing 70. We're telling you the outcome of a feasibility study that the town meeting voted to approve. Right. So our responsibility as town officials is to give you back the information you allowed us to collect. And that's what we're doing. In the senior center letter a couple months ago, it says, come go take a ride by 70 Cedar Street. That's going to be our new location. That sounds like you're pushing 70. I, I didn't, didn't even general, mention the other two places. I didn't generate a letter that said that. It was uh, Haynes, Cedar Street, and this building. We have, does anybody have a copy of that? It showed. Uh, the town didn't generate a letter that said that. It was somewhere, it said something about, you know, just, and it just, seem, it just seems like 70 is the one that you, I, I, have nothing, I have nothing to get. If you think 70 is the right spot and you're pushing 70, that's your choice. That's the, the, re the assumption you came to. I just feel like we're having a meeting here, we're showing this building, we're showing Haynes, and we're showing 70, but 
everybody's focused on 70. Why are we even talking about this building? Because that was part of the study. The okay. ask of the study was okay. to evaluate this building okay. for renovation and to evaluate two new sites for a possible new construction. And we're giving you the information that we generated in the study. So at some point, the Board of Selectmen are going to have to make a decision. The Finance Committee, town meeting will have to make a decision. Yeah. We'll have to borrow some money, all those good things. So it's our responsibility to provide you the information we collected. That way everybody's educated on what the pros and cons of every site are. But we, if it goes to town meeting or Board of Selectmen, they don't have the choice to change the location. Is what I'm asking? Sure. They don't have, do they, the Board of Selectmen can say, oh, we want to use Haynes. They or could. The town, the town, if we go to town meeting, and we vote on three locations, we can, if the town people say we want to stick with the existing building, mm -hmm. then that's what we would move forward with? Yes. Okay. The, the committee, the study committee, said all things considered in this study, this would be 70 seaters, the preferred location. That's the opinion of the committee tasked to find a location for a new building. Okay. That's a recommendation. It suits their needs. Okay. So it just seems it seems like every time we talk about it, it seems like 70, 70, 70. And it should be we can use all three spaces. They're not off the other two locations aren't off the table, but we as a committee like 70. And that always seems like it. it's, that's never the other two locations are feel like we're they're always pushed in the background. Well, 70 the board has the board has has <coughs> has shown reluctance. To go through a process of lifting the conservation restriction on 80 Haynes. Right. That's the that's the bridge too far right. for 80 Haynes. And she just mentioned a little while ago about the, the you know having the conservation restriction and having all this and having all these lawyers and all these people that knew about this conservation restriction. Yet again, we went forward with Haynes. Again, the, it was about the physical ability I to save the building. But why would you put? Why would you spend thirty-five thousand if you divided the feasibility study on a piece of property that has all these restrictions? Because we could have chose another piece. It just seems that this town has plenty of property, and if, that if, one should not have if, been. If chosen. we had plenty of property that were, was more suitable, we'd be on it. The, each one of these three sites has its pros and, and its cons. cons. None of them are ideal. Yeah. If there was the Goldilocks parcel out there somewhere. We would go get it, but there's not. There's 1,800 of acres of open space the town owns, and this is what's usable from a from a raw land perspective. I don't know. Behind the town barn, we were going to put four fields years ago. That looked like beautiful property. And Why couldn't we put it back there? Why couldn't we use that as one of the feasibility studies? Because I mean, just need, saying offhand, that's just that, wait, wait, one of the pieces. Because we need that space to expand the DPW garage. They've got a 1972 facility that's totally inadequate for their needs. So at some point, we're gonna move into a DPW project that's gonna require a different, an additional building to accommodate the buses and the fleet we have. Okay. Because right now, I didn't think outside. about that when they proposed the ball fields. I wasn't. I know you weren't, but then that would have been a question that that I understand. Point. So the records of the study committee show that they were given a list of properties from the assessor, from the town administrator at the time, They've looked at addresses such as River Road. I was reading them the other day. River Road, Town Barn. Um, there's a litany of addresses that they've gone through um, on parcels that are over two acres. Two acre minimum was, was their requirement. We own a lot of little parcels, right? A lot of little things and a lot of little things that don't add up together to make the area that we need to do this, right? One of the areas that doesn't add up to this, right, which, um, and I'll just, I'll, you know, is Brookfield Road, right? Brookfield Road is DOT land in the front, Revezzi's on the side. If even if we took all three of that together, right? So it's been a challenge. We're looking, we're constantly watching our town acquisitions, we're watching our parcels. Um, part of, you know, we're looking for that viable space. And the committee has gone through, like I said, a litany of, of addresses over and over again to come up with something that's there without the cost of acquisition, right? right? And that's sort of the goal that they wanted to do. They didn't want to add a million dollars to the price of this cost of this project to go and buy a property. 
that's something that they didn't want to put forward on the tax so, page. So as a committee, you guys proposed the three pieces of property, right? Is that what you're kind of saying? We didn't hire someone to come in blindly and look at right. Which it was maybe, proposed to uh, when, when yeah, they again, were this is going back yeah. five steps, but yeah. why yeah. doesn't the town do a feasibility study <coughs> on, hey, we own all these properties, which three do you think are the best? And maybe which three do you think are the best for ball fields? Instead of the committees taking and taking into that action and throwing it into the mix. Staff was in the middle of the whole thing for the past seven years. Well, that's what I'm saying, staff, um, but yeah. maybe an outside I just say an outside, someone that doesn't have any ties to the town as a feasibility study, what are the three best pieces that we own that we could use for these? Instead, we're, high, we're paying the committees, the people that are on the staff in town, pick three. Maybe they don't know why. Maybe she doesn't know about the conservation restrictions and she's not certified to make that call and she picks that piece of property and puts it on there for a feasibility study, but it has all the restri restrictions that are built into it. We should have known that before we paid money to do a study on a piece of property that we knew we never were gonna use. That's what I have problems with, is spending money on things that we knew had these conservation restrictions. We should have never put it on, on there for, uh, to do a study. That took us off of that. We spent 35,000 here, we do it all the time. This town does it all the time. I don't know about other towns, but we do studies on pieces of property and, and other things that we know we can't use. I'd hate to say it, but we've done it on other pieces. We've bought property that we never use. We got a parking lot out here that was supposed to be done years ago. We bought this motel and it's a, it's a mulch field across there. And we were promised a parking lot for visitors to come and walk up and down Main Street, but it didn't happen. We bought the property, it's not finished. We get into these things that... Wait a minute, let me start the parking lot. We're going to have a fall town meeting, okay? And we're going to put the funds, it's designed, it's permitted. I thought that was part of the approval in the beginning. It's designed, right. it's permitted, now we just have to bid, bid it and build it. Okay. And we're going to put the funds to do that on the town meeting. We've owned that less than a year. It wasn't years. We've owned it less <laughs> than a year. We demolished, we had it demolished, we've had it designed. Conservation permitted it, the building department permitted it. All we gotta do is allocate the funds at town meeting. It's, maybe it's the lack of communication between the town's people and not getting the information out. <coughs> Perhaps. I think we, some of that, but that's for a different discussion. That's for a different discussion. Right. And I agree with you. I don't know about the studies before. Right. I'm a builder. I've built senior centers, I've built ball fields, I've right. built town halls, police stations, schools. Right. It's a process. I understand that. And, and I don't understand you know, the conservation restriction. The board was very interested in making sure they knew that if 70 or if uh, Haines Street right. could sustain a building, they understood the conservation restriction. They just wanted to know could it physically sustain the building? Okay. And that was the question we answered. Whether or not we go forward and lift the conservation restriction is a different conversation. Can that land sustain a building? Okay. We did do during the process, one of the things that, you know, maybe they weren't very happy with me about, but just one of the things that we did do during the process is notice we used the same new construction building on both sides. We did not use the cost to design twice. Normally when you design a building, you design for that site. You design for that view shed on each individual site is different. So we saved over the course of of the feasibility study, there was $25,000 that we have not yet spent because we did stop them in the process from continuing and evaluating further things or developing further details on certain sites. So we did sort of say, wait a minute, this is a really big issue. How can we better spend your money or save your money and do that? So we, we are paying attention to those details along the process as well. So, um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think one of the one of the things about the site selection that that was very restrictive is that it had to be on town property. Both of the senior centers that I've been involved with construction work, the town went out and acquired property at a proper location. Uh, for example, when we when the board of selectmen found out that it was. Uh, probably very, very unlikely that 
um, Payne Street was a possibility, the, the existing town property. I suggested and the board discussed acquiring the two parcels to the north of, of the townhome property. One of them is an old, uh, is a torn down uh, motel. And, you know, that, that might have been a better location for a senior center than the town property with all the restrictions. Uh, we, the board also discussed acquiring, for this site here, acquiring uh, the, the site to the north of it for parking so there didn't have to be retaining walls out in the, in the front of the parcel so that the uh, architectural integrity of this building could be, as viewed from uh, Main Street, would be maintained. And, you know, basically the existing view that we have now of this building would be the same. And that, you know, the, we discussed that. So, but for some reason, the town, uh, the committee would not consider acquiring any property we, we, this my, we were tasked with looking at property we didn't own. Yeah, I know. I think that's a flaw. I, right. I, I if really the board had said, if the board had told us, selection. if the board had told us, committee, you could go pick any parcel in town you wanted to use right. to put this building on, that would have been a different conversation than when we brought you three parcels and you said go. That's a different conversation. So I understand that the parcel above us, mm -hmm. the original conversation was, uh, they, she was interested in leasing it to us, which wasn't the case. And then we were already done with the study when we talked about buying it. So I get it, and we can go get it in the future. But right now, this we're looking at what can this physical location support. I do have a bit. Ken, um, Ken, Ken is the chair of the study committee. Um, did I recall that you guys put out a request to the public back early in 2018 or so asking for parcels? After we, uh, we, we only had to do with town-owned property. That's what we were given to look at. And we were given a list of town-owned property by the assessor's office. And we had a criteria of Two, two acre. It was no less than three. So we looked, picked all those properties that were available that we thought would over three acres, and we came up with these three locations. Uh, I lost my train of thought here. Just give me a chance. I, 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 I didn't remember if I saw something yeah. in the file or not, so I'd like to ask that question. I thought you put out an RFP for sites. We did. Yeah. We okay, did. that was my After question. After we did that, yep. we did we put out an RFP yeah, for yeah. commercial owned properties. Okay, so you town. did put out a request, and, and then there were no responses. No, right. no responses. Central Register and the, uh, mm -hmm. yep. Mr. Telegram, we had no responses. We covered that. So there was nothing else available. Um, so the only, the only, the last piece, if you just go back one more slide, the last piece I want to just make sure that we don't forget about today, right? The real reason that we're here, oh, over the last year. I've received several phone calls of residents asking what my opinion is and what we need here and what building I think we should go to. So I'm gonna share with you some things that I have seen over the last 
seven years evolve here at the center. Our class sizes have doubled. We cannot run any program at the same time, due, not only due to parking, we have to stagger our programs, but also due to the size of the rooms. So we are not able to have as many residents come in to programs as we'd like because of these issues that we have. We have currently came into contact with the new owners across the street. They're able to let us park there for some events, but then again, they just opened up at two, so that has gone against us for some of our later events. We've opened up on Tuesday evenings to accommodate younger residents in town that are still working, meaning the 60 and older, so they can come to events at night. Again, we have to stagger our programs in order to do the events that we want to do at the center. I am for a new center no matter where we go. We need the space. It's not what we want, it's what we need in the community. Robin took some of the thunder already away from me today, but thank you. Um, we, we do deal with a lot of homeless people in town that I don't know if anyone is aware of. But we do, we are not a social services here, but we deal with homeless people. We deal with people in town that are in need of food, non-perishable items. Over COVID, we've seen a larger need in the town where we have connected with Burgess Elementary School as well as Tantasqua, and we're providing non-perishable items weekly to these people. We don't have the space to, to keep any of these foods on hand all the time. I don't know if anyone is aware, we lost our basement space. We used to have a pool league. Um, we used to um, have equipment. We still have the equipment down there. We have a library. We're unable to use that space due to air, poor air quality control that was noted during our walkthrough. I don't know if anybody was able, that the new, the new folks able to walk through the building yet, but I would suggest take a look, walk through the building and see what we have to deal with. Um, our classes range for 60 people to exercise. Again, we don't have the space for it, so this is what we need. We are in need of this, not what we want. Programs that, that have been brought to us, um, we are unable to do because of ceiling height or because of, you know, because of we don't have enough green space in front to accommodate these things. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the um, aspect of what we need, not what we want. And these are things that have come forward in the community. So we are, we have in the past, and you may have seen it on Facebook, we do do a cooling station here. And we put it out in the community and everyone's allowed to come in no matter what their age is. It's open to everyone. But because we don't have a generator, we don't have an emergency shelter here. And some of our folks are on oxygen. So these are things that we need. Um, there also is, let me see where, where we're at. We are in need of a lunch, uh, commercial kitchen. Our lunch program, um, thank you to the Board of Selectmen to approve, we are going out to bid, hopefully soon, um, for a new lunch program to come in because we've had always had Tri-Valley lunch. And again, the, the seniors came in, they asked for a new lunch program. We're unable to cook here, so we have to go out to bid to have a vendor come in. These are things that other senior centers are able to provide their residents that we are not able to provide due to the space issues here. So these are, I personally feel in my heart that we need it, not want it. And at the end of the day, I'm a taxpayer like everyone else, but we owe it to our seniors to give them something new. So that's how I feel. Thank you. <laughs> I agree with Leslie anyways. I, I agree that we do need a new senior center. Absolutely. This building needs either renovation or upgrades. Do these feasibility studies or is it in the next step? I'm not sure about the process. Does it, does it bring in the staffing and the upkeep and what happens if we um, get and we don't use this building and we go to another building? Do those costs come in later and telling us what they're going to be? Because we know that this building is a building that the town would never get rid of. They can't, they won't sell it. Um, they wouldn't do anything with it. It's a historic building. So we'd have an upkeep here 
an added upkeep here if we go to another building? And is the build the new building going to be staffed by full-time employees that are not who do we have full-time employees now? So currently, I'm the only full-time employee. We have a part-time outreach coordinator, a part-time program coordinator, and we have a secretary. Okay. But we do have um, a uh, um, senior work off program. Okay. I don't know if anyone's, a lot of you may be familiar with it. And we do have access to people that need, that are able, that won't that take away from the taxpayers' money. Okay, so they'll, they'll work on a so volunteer basis yeah. or something like that. So we do like have, that. yep, we have a lot of I just, I, I think that it's going to bring, I think it's going to trigger, I think that putting a new senior center is going to trigger, you know, costs, a, a, yeah. a, a, a costs that are not involved with the cost of the building, long-term cost, upkeep of maintenance of the facilities. We're going to probably have to have janitorial staff because it's a big building. It's not a, a smaller, relative small. You're talking about a commercial kitchen. Now we hiring, is the town going to employ a chef? A cook for all this, or is this gonna, you know? So these are just the questions that I have. Is that come later, or is it something that's going to happen? But I agree with you. I think some of those costs, from a mechanical and operational point of view, we we know right from a heating, cooling, insuring, all those yeah. stuff. So from a personnel point of view, I think we're going to look at an evolution of staff as programs and, and get enhanced over time. Yeah. But I don't think you can say, well, today we're spending X amount of dollars and tomorrow we're going to spend X. Yeah. I think we're going to spend more because if we move, we're still going to have to carry this building, Gross. right? Well, and you're going to have a bigger building, but it's going to be more efficient, right? you got to do those balances. Yeah. But I think over time, I would say you're going to see more staff because you're going to offer more to the public. Right. I'm just, you know, we're, we're going with the staff. Now you think about the senior center, we're gonna be, we wanna do a senior center project, they wanna do a ball field project, and now if we start doing the, all these multitude of projects, now we're talking about probably more vehicles that have to go to the DPW, more staffing for DPW, more staffing for the senior center. So the, those costs, I just don't see those costs on any of the spreadsheets we're doing now. I just wanted to ask, is that coming the next step or is it, a little bit further down the road where those costs will be added into our costs of the feasibility or the studies yeah. afterwards. So operations costs? Yeah, so we do do operational costs as part of the feasibility study um, okay. that would look at, first, for example, personnel costs and operational costs. Yeah. Um, I would have to refer to the, the uh, did we provide that for this one we, study? We did not go to that level. Right. Um, I'm, I'm in a place where we're working on green, we're a green community. Right. Um, green communities just developed a grant fund for eliminating fossil fuels, but they also have, you know, another adult project fund. So things we don't know about any new building or any addition, are we completely electric? Are we solar? Are we... You know, there's a right. There's a litany of options that we're at such an early stage that we can't predict in operating. Right. Um, from a staffing perspective, the example and and Marcia just heard the doorbell, so she just ran downstairs. But otherwise, the two staff people were here on the second floor. There was nobody downstairs. Right. Right. So those are some of the complexities that they face with the two-story building already. Um, that she's utilizing the senior workers for and things like that to supplement. Um, and then, of course, the senior program, they have a formula grant funding from the state. So they have a separate pot of money that I don't know where. So we, we receive a formula grant from Helder Affairs. It's based on how many seniors we have in town. It's a minimum, um, I think it's 250. They vote on it every year this past year, or I'm sorry, 1250 per senior. Um, last we checked, which we went off the 220 um, census, we had 1,798 seniors in town. Um, I think that number is sticking in my head. Don't quote me on that. Um, and we do receive funding from Elder Affairs per senior. And we do use, actually we're using some of that funding now to pay for our food coordinator in the kitchen. So we can use it for staff if we need it. Um, we do currently, we are paying for our food coordinator as well as we pay our exercise people with that funding. Yep. So we do have funds that we can use. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we also have an active friends group. Um, they're our fundraising arm. And if this goes through, wherever we go, again, I'm not partial to any place, but if we go through, 
their goal is going to be getting the funding for um, going out in the community and to bigger companies and getting the funding for the furnitures inside stuff. So that's going to be their goal. <laughs> they don't know it yet, but that's what their goal is. <laughs> that's what we also have PLA who is advising. Yes, yes. So they're very part of it. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a board, and we have a lot of seniors, believe it or not, that come here all the time that have feelings just like yourself. Like they don't want to move the building or they want to move the building or they want, it, at the bottom end of the day, it's not about getting, you know, not moving out of here and getting a new building. It's getting us something. We need it. We need something to grow it. All the other towns and cities in Massachusetts, across Massachusetts, are getting new senior centers. And they're getting, you know, 21st century senior centers. You know, look around us, we don't have that here. You know, but we need that. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering how, how the uh, multi-function room was sized. I mean, traditionally in, in Sturbridge, uh, there's been uh, large suppers. Uh, and right now at the senior center, this is down below us, is the largest function room in town. And we can only have a supper for maybe 60 people. Um, I, in the past, I, I remember you know, having 150 people or so at a, at a town-wide uh, I, you know, how is there any possibility of having uh, capacity for maybe a sit-down meal of 200 people or anything like that? Yeah, I, I think that the size that we've designed to could fit. I mean, you can do a quick little calculation. You know, these, and it's not going to be. Like 125. Yeah, there. And that's and that's being a little conservative because in this age of COVID, we've gone to spacing furniture wider, farther apart, <coughs> putting fewer chairs at a table, for example. But yeah, I, I think that th there is, especially in this design here, because you see that there's also a possibility. <laughs> Butter fingers. Um, you have two rooms adjacent to each other, so you could con conceivably have this as an operable partition, so suddenly you've got an even larger space for a really big, twice a year kind of um, social activity. Yeah. yeah. That that's when you would really use that commercial kitchen. Yeah. You know, yeah. is, is when you had a large supper like that. Yeah. And at this stage, we may have to have a drive through right? So let's just have everyone get out the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some other things, right, as we continue to develop and yeah, we hopefully those. move forward with something at some point that we get to develop and, and adjust for some of these Definitely. COVID things that and things like that that are little things we can easily do. but. Um, just meet the needs and the changing needs, and that's just what happens with with buildings and facilities, right? They're constantly evolving as as programs change. That would be a different type of meals on wheels to drive through. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice to not have to fix the the smoke detector when they play cornhole in here too, right? A little higher speed. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. I just have a question. So, um, with the this presentation slide deck, is it somewhere available for anyone to view who's not available to come to this meeting today? Yeah, so I will post this on the Senior Center Feasibility page. Um, I believe I posted the January one when we went to the Board of Selectmen on that. We, this is a little bit different. We added some more slides as we did do little pictures. So we will put this one up on the under facilities under Senior Center Feasibility as well. And we have an access this year today. Um, so it will go up on on-demand videos. And there's other forums to be. Other yeah. forums to be. There's going to be one at night. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're doing it at 6 p.m. on Thursday yeah. to catch a little bit different crowd at a different time of day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.